Welcome, everyone. Hello. Uh -huh. well, we've got our special guest here. I'm Susan Yost Philgate, and I'm the Education Director at the Fresno Art Museum and the Curator of the Art of the Word exhibition, Celebrating Differences, which features Raphael's works, his, his illustrations from the book Just Asked by Sonia Sotomayor. Uh, and she, of course, is the uh, Supreme Court, a uh, Supreme Court Justice. And the book focuses on differently abled children with different sorts of challenges working together to create a garden. And we're so pleased that Raphael could join us today. And I wanted to give you a little background on him before we get started. Uh, he's an internationally recognized illustrator and artist with many awards. His illustrations bring diverse characters to children, children's books, and he is driven to produce and promote books that reflect and honor the lives of young people. Uh, the book, which is the subject of the FAM exhibition, Just Ask, was a 2019 number one New York Times children's picture book bestseller and was <laughs> honored with the 2020 Schneider Family Book Award from the American Library Association. His illustrations for Dancing Hands, How Teresa Carreno Played the Piano, another book for President Lincoln, another book um, written by a local Hello. Fresno author, Margarita Engel, received the American Library Association uh, Award and a 2020 Pura, uh, Pura Bel Pre Medal. He secured the 2016 Pura Bel Pre Medal for illustration for Drum Dream Girl, which was also written by Margarita. And the 2010 Pura Bel Pre, oh, I can never say that word, Pura <laughs> Bel Pre <laughs> Medal for the book Fiesta by Pat Morrow. His 2018 picture book release, The Day You Begin, written by Jacqueline Woodson, was a New York Times number one children's picture, picture book seller, bestseller also. Uh, and he received a 2019 James Jane Addams Children's Book Award and a National Cartoonist Society Book Illustration Award for that. And in 2017, he was awarded the Silver Medal from the Society of Illustrators, the New York Original Art Show for his work on Bravo, poems about amazing Hispanics. In 2019, he created the American Library Association Latino Heritage Festival poster, and in 2012 was selected by the Library of Congress to illustrate the National Book Festival poster. He is the recipient of the 2017 Thomas Rivera Children's Book Award and three Pura Bel Pre honors and two America's Book Awards. Rafael is also the founder of the Urban Art Trail Movement in San Diego's East Village, creating a series of large scale murals that brought the community together. His murals can be found in urban areas, at children's hospitals, public schools, under freeways, and at farmers markets around the country. And in fact, in 2019, through the uh, Arnie Nixon Center for Children's Literature at Fresno State, he created a mural on a large wall on the corner of Tulare and Cedar Avenues, directly across from Roosevelt High School for the Arts. And his community work with murals is the subject of the children's book, Maybe Something Beautiful, How Art Transformed a Neighborhood. In addition to children's books and community murals, Raphael was commissioned to create seven United States postal stamps, including the Latin Music Legend series. His stamps have been featured on the cover of the commemorative stamp yearbook and exhibited at the Smithsonian. In 2008 and 2012, he was asked to create official posters for the Obama campaign to win the pivotal Latino vote. In addition to all of that, I can attest to the fact that he's a super nice guy with a, and a wonderful spirit, and it's been a great pleasure getting to know him and a great honor to be able to show him at the Fresno Art Museum. I'm going to be a, I'm going to let Raphael talk to you more about his childhood, what's inspired him, and a bit about his work. Uh, but first, I just wanted to remind you, please keep your microphones on mute, and you are free to put any questions or comments in the chat. At the conclusion of the presentation he is about to give, we will read the questions from the chat and encourage you to directly ask other questions. So, Raphael, I am turning the microphone over to you. Thank you, Susan, and uh, what an honor to be here today with you guys. Uh, Susan and I have been working on this for a long time, and it's been a lot of back and forth, and a lot of it, it's her patience on me, because <laughs> I was a little difficult to uh, to spot since I was living in Mexico at the time. But anyways, here, we're back in my studio in San Diego. This is it, you can see it a little bit here. I'm gonna scan a little bit so you can see where things are and you can get an idea. I have some pictures of my most recent uh, collaboration with Jacqueline Woodson. This book is coming out in, I believe, March. So you're looking at a little first peek at some of the images from the book. 
And that's where I put all the stuff right there. So um, um, I wanna thank all the uh, art instructors that are here as well with us. And it's gonna be very intimidating. And I see some beautiful work and some of the walls behind there. So this is very cool. I feel like I'm amongst friends. And I wanna to talk to you more rather than just showing you my work, which you are maybe familiar with it, is the reasons why, where I come from and what inspired me. So without further delays, I'd like to take you on a little journey if you uh, want to come with me and see if I can make this start. So I'm gonna do a screen share and I'll start talking a little bit more about myself. So here we go. And let's do the share here. And I'm gonna hit the play right there. So. Let me know if you can see it, Susan. Can we see it? There we go. Okay, excellent. That's good, so, can see it. Great, thank you. So, um, I'm gonna, it just takes a little while for it to, to get going. Here we go. Um, you're familiar with some of my books. Uh, I started really entering into the children's book many, many years later after um, I graduated from school. Uh, it, it, it took about 12 years before I finally ventured into the uh, book world. But uh, I was born in Mexico City. I'm the, uh, the, the child of uh, two architect parents. And from an early stage, they wanted me, they introduced me to many things, including playing the guitar, which at the time was huge. I couldn't play it, so I played it more like a bass sometimes. Um, uh, I was introduced to different music from Latin America. I learned to uh, learn the flute and some of the other things. I was part of like this folkloric music thing. So my parents were pretty much child, the, the children from the 60s. And I was also part of that whole thing in the 60s. <laughs> Like I said, they were both architects that met in school. And like any other Hollywood movie, they hated each other, their personalities, and eventually they fell in love. I don't know, tell me how that happens, right? But it did. Uh, Mom is 85 years old, and there she is. She's still one of my most uh, admired persons, one of my best friends, not on the top three, but top five. Of course, I love mom. Uh, she is very inspirational, and she has always been an inspiration on, on because of her career, because of the chances that she had uh, as, as a, a young girl in the 50s, when she wanted to become an architect in Mexico, uh, Mexico at the time um, did not see women going into careers that were considered for men only. But she persevered, uh, despite everybody saying no. So she said uh, she <laughs> ignored the naysayers. And she has been a great inspiration, not only for me, but also for the subjects and the, the books that I pick. Because in some way, I, I like to pay honor and respect to what she has done in her real life. Uh, she collects, of course, some of my early childhood drawings. This is one that I did when I was about five years old, when I was exploring my black and white things. I went to a very special school where they really um, foster that creativity. And so every afternoon, she would let, let, let us stay for another two hours on these uh, different workshops that were either painting or pottery or mosaic or puppetry or photography. And we did this through the whole elementary school. Um, at the time, too, we had some friends. All of our friends were very uh, bohemian. Uh, the guy on the mustache to the right is a, a dear friend of ours, Felipe Ehrenberg. She is a very well-renowned um, artist in Mexico uh, that passed away a couple of recently, about three or four years ago. And uh, Felipe Ehrenberg had to flee Mexico because of his political views at the time and moved to England and created this group of uh, uh, idealistic artists and they they lived in this farm so my parents uh, decided that they were going to send me to this farm so I moved to England and lived with them for a while uh, this is the part of the group this is the farm where we lived and this is back in the 1970s I would say 1972 I was 11 years old that's me and after this my stint in England uh, I was ready to pack my stuff and go back to Mexico City and then uh, Felipe said, uh, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm going back home. And I said, you're not going empty handed. You got to record what you saw and what you lived and your experiences here. So I want you to make a book because of course he was an artist and he had one of those printing presses in the bottom in the basement of the, of, the, um, of the farm. And that's what I did. I just started drawing and these are my early drawings for the book. So I would consider this my very first official children's book. So maybe I started a lot earlier than I thought. My mother also allowed me to paint on the walls. This was my room. And one day I just told her that I wanted to live in this Egyptian tomb. And he goes, go for it. I love National Geographic. So I just uh, opened up a bunch of magazines and I just put it all together. And then I started painting my mural. So this mural is not as old as the originals, of course, by a few thousand years, but it's there. And, uh, and I, I just love the fact that my mom just left it there, you know, once I finished it. So this was during the summer. So there was always, I had this very, um, 
lucky group of supporters, whether they were teachers or mentors and tutors. And I always like to tell students that if they can't find that in their family, they can find it in their, in their students or mentors or friends or librarians. But there's always gonna be someone that believes in you. Uh, eventually we moved to the border um, because my dad was from the north part of Mexico. He never really liked Mexico City. So we moved to the border and then I started college, but I was go going across the border to the other side in Texas. And this is what I have to wait through every day. I have to get up at four in the morning and wait in line to go to school and get there by eight or 8.30. So I had to get up pretty, pretty early. And at that coffin that you see on the side, that's not really a coffin. That's my portfolio that I sent to Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. Because during college in Texas, I met this mentor and he says, I think you should go to uh, Pasadena. Uh, I think that you got something in there and I think you got to give it a try. So I want to thank Michael, uh, my mentor, for guiding me into the right direction. And while I was in Pasadena, I learned different techniques. I had wonderful teachers, but mostly I learned from just looking and comparing my work to other kids that were just fantastic. They were blowing me away. Uh, these were some of my pencil renderings that I was doing at the time. I was in my late teens, early 20s. And the one thing that I really learned in the school was concept. And I think that really came very useful at the end uh, because rather than teaching me just to do things the way I see them, they taught me to think and to solve problems. So um, this is just one, one of my first examples of that conceptual illustration that I started doing at the time. Uh, once I graduated and I went to, uh, I did a, a, a trip through Europe and North Africa, I came back and I started getting very, very busy with, especially with, um, spe especially, uh, with uh, financial reports. So I was doing a lot of this uh, office stuff, uh, people jumping on buildings and computers. And after many years, someone one day sent me a sketch about an idea for a computer company. And it says, um, we want you to do this this great idea we have because we have these servers that are just very light. So I want you to have this like Latino woman carrying this, this thing in the back and it's our server. And we want to say, the tagline is gonna say, our servers are so light that even, um, even this person can carry it in her back. And I was so offended by this idea that I decided that it was time to move on and do something else other than just the corporate work that I was doing at the time because I was seeing a lot of these images about me and my country and Mexico. And I, as you can see, I was like in London, I was doing things with like this hippie community. There's nothing here that says who I was. So I wanted to find my voice, my own voice to say, I, I wanna show the world that, and all the people to, that there's an opportunity for them to show who they really are and, and, and spread that word out and spread their, their story. So the first thing you need to do is find inspiration. Where did you get that inspiration? And you're, you're looking at a white wall and it's like, where do I go? Where do I begin? Well, first thing I had to do is explore color. And where am I from? I'm from Mexico. And of course, Mexico is full of colors. No matter where you go, you can't escape colors. So none of us have chromophobia. You just learn to live with this bright, bright color from the very beginning when you, you, when you were born. And I love also the textures of the towns where, where uh, we live. I live in a a uh, small uh, city called San Miguel de Allende. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's in central Mexico in the colonial area of Mexico. And this is the stuff that you find when you walk in the street. So I always carry my camera with me and I love finding these things because this eventually sip or filter into my work. People tell me you, your work is not only colorful, but it's very textural. And it's just, uh, it's just an expression of what I see every day when I walk the streets of Mexico. And of course, the color on people's, you know, on their, their, their feathers. And no matter where you go, you're going to see it. It's also the surrealism of Mexico. There's all these weird things that you see. You walk around the corner and you have these giant, you know, muerte dolls. And, you know, they're, they're fun and they're celebratory and it could be scary for some people. But to me, I like the juxtaposition of things that are familiar and the unfamiliar in the familiar. And you go, hey, you know, this is this is pretty inspirational as an artist. I think that I can do this with my work too. Put put the unfamiliar with the familiar. Um, here's a good example of that. This is actually a building. This is not Photoshop. This is a, a building in in San Miguel de Allende. I don't know how they got the permit to build this, but I found it pretty refreshing and fascinating. And I believe it's like a like a, a place where you can go and, and rent it for parties, especially if you're like a Audubon Society thing. I don't know. That's just a joke. I don't know. But anyways, this is the stuff that I, I really find fascinating. 
And of course, I needed to get back to some of the artists that I, I pay homage to um, and like the, the way they draw and they depict Mexicans, the hardworking, the, the, this heroic way of doing people like Diego Rivera and Siqueiros and Orozco. And I started doing my own. I started to explore and saying, you know, maybe I can get back and connect to that part of me, the, my country, my past. And I started doing that a little bit with some of my early work. This is from Art California. Uh, I, I collaborated with Pan Munoz Ryan. And we did a whole tour of California, but I wanted to do it in my own way. I didn't want it to be exactly the way things are, but more like, what is the memory that left behind me when you visit these places? Um, I also encourage um, young students and artists or anyone to carry always um, a notebook or a notepad or just a little thing where you can do sketches. Carry always a pen or your camera and then just do things whenever it strikes your fancy and just sit down and draw something wherever you are, whether you're sitting in a cafe or waiting for a train to come or, or waiting for your Uber drive. There's always a time for an idea that if you don't drive, you know, write it down, it's, it's just going to go away and then you're going to go, oh, it's gone forever. So spark in the imagination. Let's see what this is all about. Oh, yes. So you have to find your biggest, biggest inspiration. In my case is, of course, my son, Santiago. This is Santiago. Of course, he's now almost 20 years old. But Santiago started drawing at a super, super early age. And I love what he was doing. He was drawing things like this when he was like five years old. He was putting so much attention. And he was drawing way better than his class. Um, so when I look at this, I thought, hey, you know what? If I'm going to be illustrating for kids, maybe instead of like spending so much time looking at reference and photos and going to the library and finding all this time that consuming moments where my energy was spending too much and finding the things to look, the, the, the thing looked like a real elephant. Why don't I just portray an elephant the way kids could see an elephant? And this was sort of like an aha moment for me because I started having more fun. I started spending more time here in the studio versus looking at things and photos and the wrinkles and the textures and this and that. And I thought, you know what? Instead of drawing from photos, I'm gonna start drawing from the heart, from the memory, the feeling that I have of what a thing would look like because kids get it, you know? Kids are very sophisticated. And then I can actually use this as a, as a uh, canvas where I can just put elements all around and I'm not limited by reality anymore. And so this was a really defining moment for, for my career and my style. Um, here's another one. He must have had some spicy Mexican food and he was having a nightmare. But the next morning he drew this thing, this giant blue bear, and I thought it was hilarious. So I went and, and sneaking into his room and I took it away. And because of this one, I was inspired to do this. Another one of my illustrations for a book with uh, Pat Mora. Yom Mkarico. And of course, here it's when everything comes together, you know, my, my kids drawing and this realism of Mexico and the textures and the bright colors. So things start to slowly come across. I always tell people don't force things, just let it happen. And it's just going to eventually you're going to look back and you're going to say, mm, I see something going on. You know, I think that if you force it, it's just not going to really take place. So just a few examples of that where I can put all those elements that I've been trying to learn and put them in there. And I, I use, use the canvas. If you can see, I'm very two-dimensional. I try, I, I use very little um, perspective. There's not a lot of depth in my work. Uh, huge inspiration, I would say, is Eric Carle. I like the way he does that for kids. It makes it very simple and graphic. So you, you can see it here with all the things kind of come together, you know, a little inspiration of Rousseau as well. So, um, I'm just, it's all about not just having fun, looking at things, not like a hair, but just like an element. I don't see the face as a face. I see it as an element. I don't see the peacock as a peacock. I see it just like another design element. So I think of things as design elements and then they finally come into place like on a puzzle. So let's see. Um, yeah, here's a few, a couple of examples of that as well. So trying to keep it simple, trying to think of the, the kids and the children and the young people that are now my, you know, my audience. Um, so during, during the career too, I was doing too much work for just uh, corporations that were getting just rich and they were just paying me to buy, sell a product and they wanted to introduce it and there, and you know, I just thought I can do more with my career than just like making other companies getting, you know, getting wealthier or helping them do their thing. I want to get involved more with more important things such as getting into the political thing. So I was invited to, um, by the Obama campaign to create one of their posters. So this is uh, me painting the one for the very first uh, um, election in 2008. And we did the uh, Nuestra Voz or Our Voice for the Latino to try to reach the Latino voice because at the time the Latinos were 
really uh, heavily leaning toward Hillary Clinton, but then she, she lost. And then we have this unknown, this senator from Chicago. No one really knew at the time who he was. So, you know, I put my little grain of salt on this one and uh, my little, you know, collaboration, and we created uh, Vos Unida. Uh, the following four years later on, we created another one called Unidad. So that was for the, uh, the, the next election. So it was really great to know that my work could actually now reach a different different people, a different group of people. And it just meant that I was doing something more than just working for a corporation. And that was pretty gratifying as well. Uh, I got involved into doing also stamps. This was uh, one, a case about the Mendes family that they were not allowed to attend the really nice school of their the, 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 the area where they lived. They needed to go to the Latino school where things were break, broken down and the toilets didn't work and all these horrible things. So they took their fight to the Supreme Court just before Brown versus Board of Education and they won. So they asked me to do the, um, the stamp for them. So this is like the family, the Mendes family coming into the light and some of the sketches that I created. So um, I started getting involved too doing stamps, which has been very gratifying. And of course, what's really gratifying is to have the big opening of the stamp in the Sylvia Mendes School in Los Angeles. It's named after the young girl that was denied access to a good school. And here's all the kids celebrating. And this is the stuff that really tears you up, you know, when you're there with them and you, you can't even talk, you're trying to make a speech and you're like, guys, I, I, I can't do it, I'm sorry. Uh, another example of some of the things I've been invited to do, these were the uh, Latino legends uh, from Tito Puente all the way to Gardel and Celia Cruz. This was fun. And this is one of the first time that they actually portray people with their mouth open. Usually they don't do that. They say, no, no, no. And I say, well, they're singers. I mean, aren't they supposed to be singing? So I had to go back and forth. And eventually after a few uh, emails, they, I convinced them that we needed to have them singing, you know, rather than just posing and being looking pretty. Uh, this is my latest collaboration with the post office. I just finished five stamps uh, celebrating mariachi. And originally there was going to be just one stamp. And I said, wait, whoa, there's usually five mariachis, at least five mariachis in a band, you know, so we need to have, and I needed to include at least a woman because there's a lot of mariachi, female mariachis that are amazing. So I convinced them at least to have one of them being a woman. And these are going to come out next year. So I can show you two of them, but there's actually five. This is the uh, the pencil drawings that I show them, and this is going to be the final uh, stamps that are coming up. So um, keep an eye for us for uh, next year. I think it's going to be the fall of 2022. It'll be it'll be fun. Um, so illustrating children's book. Let's get to this. Uh, I started with Celia. Celia was my first book ever. After 10 years of being a, a, a conceptual illustrator, I got a call on the studio, and someone says. We like your work. It looks very Latino, colorful. We have this story. We're a small uh, a company in Northern Arizona, and it's this life of Celia Cruz. And I thought, no, no, I don't do this stuff. And he goes, oh, yeah, you can do it. I go, no, no, I, I'm afraid to do this consistent work through the thing and the changes, and she gets older, and I don't know how to do that. And she, I kept saying no, and she kept saying yes. She called me back several times, and she finally convinced me. <laughs> and then... Oh, man, it was great because I have no idea what, what I was getting into. And then, of course, it won an award because I have no idea what I was doing. And, and then I thought, oh, this is going to be fun. You know, you win awards, too. Of course, I didn't realize that I was getting adventuring into something when there is amazing talent. And there's every year there's a new talent that comes out and editors are exploring new venues. And I just love to be I'm very uh, fortunate to be in, in the children's book uh, market at the time because I think it's like a new golden age again where they're allowing personal voices to be expressed and they understand that kids get it you know they don't need to see just one type of book they need to see different things uh, my collaboration a couple of years ago with uh, Justice uh, Sonia Sotomayor was incredible it was incredible to meet her she was a wonderful person to me with incredible incredible energy uh, and I, I get the, maybe that's why they hire her because she she never gets tired. We rem I remember signing books with her for over three hours, and she would talk to every single person and gave her, you know, her ear. And she says, "Sit down, I want to hear your story." It's just amazing, you know. She is a, an incredible, inspirational person. But um, part of the the story about meeting her it was the fact that my child my child Santiago uh, has autism. He has high functioning autism. So this story really resonated with me in a very personal way. So I wanted to be part of this book and I wanted to show that also I suffer from dyslexia when I was a kid, but I also wanted to include uh, someone like my kid, that, that he, my kid could see himself in, in this group of kids. So uh, you go through a bunch of sketches 
And then, of course, the idea is to portray them not as victims, not as people that are weak, so as super people, super people that are just different than, than other people are. And they have their own abilities and their own powers that we lack. One of them is my, my son has this amazing memory and he can draw incredibly well. And he also likes to collect things. So I wanted to have this kid that collects dinosaurs. And of course, he thinks of a rainbow as just a little passage to go to another place, you know? So yeah, we, we try to be very careful about, about, about how we portray people. We didn't want any people to see themselves being portrayed in a weak way. So I think that we, we pull it off as best as we can. Uh, this is, of course, my collaboration. Margarita Engel and I have collaborated in three books. She's one of the uh, your local uh, celebrities there. And she's a very dear friend. I love her stories. And what I love about Margarita is that she writes stories from people that are very little known. And she puts them into the limelight. So um, that resonates with me, too. I mean, being uh, someone from another country and coming here and learning the language and all that, just like what happened here to uh, Teresa Carreño. The real life story of someone that had to flee the country. I remember uh, people having a, a little bit of a difficult time with this sad um, scene. And it's like, well, we're talking about escaping and leaving your country behind. I mean, that's heartbreaking in many ways. You leave so much family and friends behind. I think kids can handle this. So we were, you know, finally we came to an agreement that this needed to be included because we were talking about the Civil War as well in the US when she arrived in the late uh, 1860s but also about the joy discovering that she's been invited to the White House while she was in Cuba playing the piano. So yeah, my stories, I like to connect to stories when they come into my desk because and they need to be stories about power. They need, in some way, I need to see my mother portrayed in these stories and say, yes, this is a story about challenges and that overcoming challenges. And uh, so every time a, a story like that comes into my studio, I'm like, yes, let's do it. I wanna do it. I can't wait to do it. Um, bravo again too, of course, being Latino, there were a lot of people that I didn't know. So I needed to be involved in this as well. There were so many, uh, there were a few people that of course I was familiar with, but many others that I never heard of. This is another collaboration with Margarita Engel. And it was just great to do the research and learn so much about these amazing Hispanics. Uh, these are some of the samples of some of them. Of course, you can see there Cesar Chavez at the bottom left, but then some of the other ones, I have no idea, never heard of them. So this was our chance and our and with our collaboration to show them to the rest of the US and hopefully to the rest of the world who they were and their contribution. Uh, I've had a couple of collaborations with uh, Jacqueline Woodson. One of our uh, books is coming out. I love the way she uh, writes. It's just an amazing writer. She is incredibly prolific, but she gets to the things that really talk to my heart as well, because she talks about things like feeling different when you go to school. And I feel the same way. And that's why I connected to the story. I connected to coming to the US when I was 18, I didn't speak the language, I felt different, I saw people, I felt like people were staring at me in high school. So this really resonates to me, the stories that she writes about and how eventually you become friends with other people that have a similar story. There, there's nice people all around you. It's just, you need to get peel all those layers of protection to get to know each other. Uh, and of course, self-discovery as well, right? It's like, who am I? And what's my place in the world? And what am I going to be doing in the future? So it's a great message to leave to the kids and adults, to everyone. You know, maybe our time hasn't arrived, but maybe it will arrive one day when you find yourself, what is the reason we are here in this world? Okay, let's see now. Um, last one is, uh, I'm going to talk about my last book. My, my last book just came out. It's I'll Meet You in Your Dreams. And this is a collaboration with Jessica Young, and it's about the, uh, the love that we have between parents and kids or, or caretakers or any family member and you, and how that uh, love goes and moves and lasts forever, no matter how young or how old you are, and how it's just fun to be with that person and pretend to be other things if you want to be in how through the passage of time you move away, you go to college, and then you come back and now mom is older, but you still love her. And um, it's it's just a great story. Uh, it's been, a, a, the comments that I've heard is that it's a tearjerker. Everybody that, that I see is like, oh man, I didn't realize what it was going to be like until half the middle of the story. Showing you a little bit of what I do in the studio. This is my table where I do all my experimentations. I, I work with rollers, uh, with ink. I use a plexiglass where I roll the paint and then I press a little piece of paper or tissue paper and I create hundreds and hundreds of different textures. What I do after this, I go into my scanner and I scan them as textures or I scan and I turn them into what is called digital brushes. 
So this is what I apply later on on my my computer work because now because of time con uh, like it's very co constrained they only give me three to four months to do a book I need to do things now digitally because it, it's a lot faster this way so I I go out there and I sprinkle everything I do everything by hand everything that I create is created of course in the studio by hand but instead of applying it to each individual piece I now have it safe forever I'm never gonna lose this it's gonna be on my on my uh, yeah, library of uh, different textures. And then of course I come into my computer. I have my, my, my Wacom that I've learned to play. It took me a, there was a learning curve of about six months but I finally feel more confident. And all those textures that you see on the dresses and the wall and everything is created here in the studio. Um, and finally, I'm gonna talk about growing community. Uh, I'm gonna show you, I'm very proud to show you my, my, um, my loft. This is where I live. Yes, isn't that beautiful? So I bought my loft about it's it's actually an old car garage from the 1940s and i remember um, my father-in-law giving me the thumbs up my mother-in-law almost had a heart attack and but being the son of architect and uh i thought you know this this could this could happen this could be a really fun place to to live and to make it a studio so it's a, a 3000 oh, no over 3000 square foot car garage and it looks like this now. Of course, this is where I'm standing right there. And then it expands. I have a door that slides and closes and it just keeps going. And then I have a, a second floor. So this is where everything, all the messiness and all the fun stuff takes, takes place here. And then I, I move upstairs to the, to the computer. And that's where all the digital thing uh, finally takes place. So this is part of the uh, studio tour, I guess. And when I have extra time, I like to find all pieces of wood and you can see those little robots at the end there. These are all found, found pieces of wood that I see and I collect and then I glue them together when I'm waiting for approval because it drives me crazy that sometimes you have to wait a couple of days. So in the meantime, I do either an illustration for myself or I put something together. Um, so yeah, of course, um, the studio looked beautiful on the outside and on the inside, but the outside looked like this. Our whole neighborhood looked like this. The walls were peeling off, everything was boarded off, there were graffiti all over the place. And we thought, you know, how can we, we can't live like this, you know, we're artists, how can we live around surrounded by this? And we talked to other people and they're like, well, we don't know what to do either, you know, this looks horrible. So then we all got together, we came to the studio, we invited people, neighbors, the police, everybody and says, okay, we got some problems outside, so what do we do? And then all of a sudden we started thinking, you know what, we have the talent, we have the people, we have the resources, why don't we just create weekends when we can come and people can donate either tile or paint and let's just get permission from the city and the people of business owners and let's start just like doing beautifying our neighborhood you know just with having these people just volunteering and coming over so i'm showing you some examples of some of the uh, san diego gas and electric gas boxes that were completely tagged they look horrible so we decided to invite people to start painting and we're talking this is about 17 years ago so it's been quite a while since we did this and of course, the, world, the, the buildings came later, right? It was a building. So I'll show you just one that we created. This was created later on in San Francisco in the Bay Area. Uh, this was for a school. And this is how it starts. It just starts with you measuring this whole wall and you have a week basically because we have very limited budget. So I needed to design things that were very flat and very graphic. And then I teach kids how to do it all. This is my um, um, tools that I use for, my, for, my, um, for the creation of my murals. And of course, I wanted everybody to be part of it. And I didn't want people to feel intimidated. So I thought flat is good. It's also good to repair. If ever get, if ever gets tagged, you can just repaint back that flat color. You can have people that are experienced or you can have people that never touched the brush in their life paint with you. So I, I started first doing my own uh, sketches. I, you, I teach them how to do like curves by using just a string and, 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 and the stick. And of course, I, I don't know if you can see, but you, you know, I teach them how to do like the whole grid so that we can transfer the little drawing into the big, big wall. And then I thought, you know what? Instead of me doing that, I'm gonna let them do it. I'm gonna have the kids and all the volunteers learn how to do this. So now I sit back and I just, just enjoy it. I just sit and I just go over there and I think, ah, oh, I made a mistake. They go, don't worry about it. You know, We're gonna paint this at the end and it's gonna be fine. So just keep doing, have fun. And then, of course, the kids are waiting, you know, at, at the end just to start painting. We usually start with the outlines so that those are very carefully put together. So the, the colors are touching each other in a very careful way. And then we let the very, very young kids just fill in the inside. So this usually takes about five days to create from beginning to end from like, you know, doing the grid until we put the last uh, brush stroke. 
uh, you can see here when I'm, I'm teaching them how to do this whole thing where I'm teaching the, the, the line thing very carefully. And slowly, this is how it starts to be, you know, come together. Once I put it all together, it makes, it makes sense because when you see all those little dots indicators, it looks, it looks really confusing though. Um, here I am doing a little bit of that uh, demonstration for the kiddos, how to hold the brush in an angle, da, 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 da. I gave him a little bit of how to do it on the wall and then go at it, kid, have fun. And then we usually have groups of kids because I get to have maybe 150 kids and there's just way too many. So we have, uh, we have time slots where a group paints from 9 to 9.30 in the morning and another one from 9.30 to 10, another one from 10.30 to 11. And that's what we did in, uh, in, in the uh, mural in, in um, Fresno as well. Uh, this is what I call my rainbow bar where I put all the colors so people come and pick their own. I have the young, older kids actually in charge of pouring the color to the younger kids and then they go to the wall and then just start painting away. Here they are. So what's really important about the community murals is not really painting this beautiful, whatever, right, colorful thing. It's about community coming together. Uh, many of these people tell me, you know, I didn't know my neighbor. He lives next door down the street and I had no idea. We lived together here 20 years and I never said hi to him. And today we just became friends because we're painting this mural together. So it's about strengthening the community. Uh, and if, if a good mural comes out, it's a call for mural comes out and people remember it for 10, 15, 20 years, great. So it's not really about the mural, it's about bringing people together though. And that's what happens. I like to see how the little kids gain their confidence. Uh, I like to see how moms can help when we run out of ladders, you know, everybody's just helping out. I like to see how uh, grandparents get involved as well. The whole family is invited. Everybody that just walks by and they say, can I, oh, sure, go ahead. You know, we got plenty of space. Uh, I love how young and, and old are painting in the same uh, area and they have a, a moment to participate and talk. I, this, I was really moved by this old man and he's, he spent like a, a, an hour there talking to this young girl and it was just so beautiful to see. They didn't know each other, but there was, it was a great moment to, be, make, to make friends, right? To connect with humanity again uh, without a cell, a cell phone in front of you, right? To actually talk to each other. So this is what happens. This is why I love community murals. It's not about them watching me paint. It's about me giving them an opportunity to give them something that is very simple to paint. And then we can all come together, just like in the book, of course. So yes, that inspired our book, uh, maybe something beautiful. And many people ask me about the policeman said, oh, does this really happen? And I go, yes, it did happen. Actually, I was in Chicago painting a mural and uh, I hear this car stopping by. And then I hear the door slam and I turn back and there's this big, big guy, you know, he was as big as John Wayne. He walked like John Wayne and come in and goes, are you Mr. Lopez? And I was like, oh, you, yikes, I'm in trouble. Did I need a painting permit or something? I go, yes, yes. And he looked at me very seriously and then he just cracked a little smile. And he goes, hey, can I paint with you? And that's him right there. That's my guy. He just wanted to sit and paint, have a little fun. So he had, he had to be in the book, of course, because I thought that was one of those great moments. So, so we invite now the, 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 anybody that can come, police like to come and stop by and say hi and check. And then, I see, and then they, you, know, you, you, you see the look on their face. And then I look at him and I go, you want to paint, right? And they go, yeah, you don't mind. Do you mind? I go, no, 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 here's some color, got it. So it's just so much fun because it's also an opportunity for some of the groups that live in the neighborhood to show and, and, and be proud of their culture and show us. So we usually, in, on the last painting day, we organize like a huge event, whether it's mariachis and we have salsa music or we have some uh, performers or maybe there's like a, like a, you know, like a, like a Indian community and they, we invite them over to show us their beautiful dances and they bring their food. And we, we just, I mean, it's just amazing, guys, what happens when, when, when you do this and you, you're painting a mural. You never know what's going to happen, but I assure you, you're going to have a lot of fun, though. So this is it. We try to, you know, bring that into the book. And, and just to show you that it does happen, this is not all there, but I mean, this is the one that we created. We had these great mariachi ladies. I just love to share these photos because it's just so much fun when you're nearing the end of the completion of the mural and you turn a wall that never gave no one a thought or no one ever stopped by from this dull wall into something like this, where you can sit and converse and talk and be proud of that, that collaboration that you had a couple of years back. This was one that we did in Chicago where two, two girls were shot by gang members. Fortunately, they survived. But this was a really scary uh, uh, underpass during, uh, under the train tracks. And um, moms had to take their kids to school every day and moms and dads. And they invited me and say, hey, this is a very scary place. Do you think we can do something with this? And I, I thought about it. I go, this is it. I mean, this is, my, this is the call I love, you know, when someone really needs my... So this is what we created. 
this is what we've done. And it's so much fun because now next door, they put a community um, garden and every summer they or spring, everybody gets together and they plant, they do the replanting and the rebirth and the whole thing. And they keep the mural in really good shape. And now across the other side behind me, it's another mural that another local artist uh, created. He actually helped me paint this with the community and it was so much fun. So yeah, it's a growing thing. It's kind of like a, a good virus, I guess you would call it because it just spreads out all the good vibes and the good energy though. Uh, this is the one that we did in um, Fresno. I don't know if you're familiar with this. And it was a, a really well, a very well-deserving community. So this is what it looked like before. And this is us in the process of finishing the mural. Same wall, same exact wall before and after. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of change in it, but it's all about the community, of course, and coming together. So, but more than that is about that pride that you see in the little young spaces, right? And how they just feel so proud of their contribution to this gigantic piece of work. And uh, some of them will inspire you to come up with that. Uh, you think of this little girl and you go, you know what? She is just the perfect person to create a character for my children's book, right? And she was the inspiration for Maida. So um, yeah, this has been my journey so far and I hope to continue on. You know, I'm 60 years old and I still feel like I have a lot to learn and I have a lot to share and to, um, to, to collaborate with. So uh, thanks again for this. Um, your time, you guys, and I'm gonna stop the share. And we are gonna go back to, hopefully, let's see right here, to Susan. There we go. And um, just wanted to show you um, very quickly um, some of the things that I do. I mean, this is the stuff that I was showing you where I have my plexiglass, my rollers. This is my rollers all here. And, uh, you know, I just pour some paint in this. I just drop it in there. I do this kind of roll thing or I grab a little bad rag and then eventually I come over and I just put a piece of white paper into it and I press this really hard and I lift it up and I come up with things like this or this, depending on what I do. Some of them don't really work very well, but um, this is all experimentation for me. Every, um, every book, it's another opportunity and another possibility to experiment something. Just a few of the textures that I like to uh, scan. This could be a lovely garden. Of course, if you look at it, they're all in black and white. Why? Because in the computer, they could be any color, any color at all. I mean, once I scan it in black and white, I can just, um, I can just give it a, a, a color and say, this is gonna be uh, purple, or this is gonna be burgundy, this is gonna be black or white or yellow. And, uh, and then I have this same texture, but done in so many different ways. Uh, very quickly, I'll show you the way I used to work before. This is uh, one I did for, oh, I think it's upside down. Here we go. And this was for, um, I believe it was uh, Book Fiesta. And if you can see, um, it's all done in wood. And I like to create this, this frame so people can either make them stand or hang them on the wall. But this used to be very, very time consuming. Uh, and I love this and I miss working this way because I, I just love getting involved with that, the hand part. I like to get messy and do stuff and experiment. However, when I start painting this way, it takes a week to do a painting like that versus only two days or three days on the computer. So it's pretty much all about just uh, the time that I have, the limited time. Uh, if I have time, I would do more things like you see in the back, you know, where you can see some of the, uh, the traditional paint. So uh, I don't know how much time we have. We have, we have about uh, 12 minutes. I don't know, Susan, if you want to do some Q&A, any Q questions that people have? Sure, let me see. There was something in the chat, where'd it go? Okay. Oh, oh. Um, yeah, thank you. That was, that was wonderful. I mean, I've oh, really enjoyed you. that. <laughs> thank you. Just amazing. And someone asked, have mm -hmm. you ever been blocked as an artist? If so, what was it like for you? Like you mean mental block? I don't know what she means. Maybe a mental. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, Michelle Moritz. Yeah. I don't know where you oh, are. You hey, Michelle, I see yeah. you there. Yeah. 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 Just um, were you, if you've ever been at an impasse, your, your, your life sounds so amazing and you don't sound <laughs> like you've ever been blocked, oh, yeah. but you're well, talking to an artist who is blocked. So I'm <laughs> like, I'm reaching for. Um, I hear you. So that's going to be my, my tomorrow's presentation is the mental block one. And that's not very good. It's sad. So bring your tissues. because <laughs> We all, of course, we all suffer from uh, mental blocks. And um, I think that uh, I haven't had one in about uh, 
20 hours maybe. So that's probably a record, you know? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, they happen all the time. And I think part of it is the fear of uh, trying something new. Uh, but I also impose myself to try something new. I don't want to do the same ever over again. I don't want to be known as someone that has the same look all the time. I want to, I don't want to be defined by a look. I want to, I want to apply what I think is, is, is good to the project. Like in the case of maybe something beautiful, it was, they were talking about my neighborhood, my San Diego, even though it was a fictitious neighborhood, right? But I thought it would be a good idea to include some of the real buildings in the downtown area in San Diego. So I went out and I decided to use photography. So I took a lot of photos of the, of the neighborhood, of the buildings that we actually painted. And then, of course, I only cropped parts of them and I manipulated them. So you can't really see that, but they're there. If you pay close attention, then you look and you go, that looks like a real building. And then, you know, if you ever call me, I say, yeah, that's actually a neighborhood, yeah, the real neighborhood. So that's what I mean. There's always a, a possibility to try something new. But uh, I also, when something, when I'm blocked, I don't panic anymore. I just go, okay, I'm blocked today. Maybe I'll be blocked tomorrow. Who knows? But I like to go to a museum. Usually museums really like, you know, like they, they do something to me and I come back and I go, ah, I can't wait. Look at those guys. You know, they're amazing. So I go back from a museum and I just immediately go to the art store. And then I, it's like, when, it's, but it's bad because it's like when you go to the supermarket where you're hungry, right? So you buy a bunch of stuff and you're like, oh, slow down, you know? And then I come back and I try to do everything. So yeah, that usually a museum, it's a good idea for me. Um, I used to go to the movies, but now maybe I see a, a video, maybe a video, I put music, the music sometimes spark things to see. I grab some of my books, I go to the library or have some really cool books that I haven't opened in a while. And so I open books and I go, oh, wow. I mean, look, this, this guy, come on. I mean, if he can do it, at least I can give it a try. So there, there are certain things that I have, certain tricks that I have found for me not to just sit and, and look at him and go, wow, that's it. I run out of ideas because it's almost like when you think, I think every music has been already invented and played. And then 10 years go by and you go, they continue to invent things new. So I think that we haven't really got to the limits of what art is and what people can create. So I believe that that's possible, right? There's still things that we haven't seen. Why not be, make that little effort, right? And so at least I try. That was a long-winded answer. I'm sorry, but there you go. <laughs> Tomorrow, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hi, John Amarine. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Thanks for joining us too. So uh, to I, John, go ahead. Uh, I was going to comment that I noticed a lot of uh, some of your other works that you were doing that you, you had this look of Diego Rivera in there, but mm -hmm. not quite him. But it was really mm -hmm. appealing. Yeah. And also, also a little bit. I don't know if you're acquainted with R.C. Gorman. I've yes yes uh, from Colorado Springs yes he, that yeah. was his base and yeah. so he, he passed away a number of years ago but he his stuff as an American native mm -hmm. that, yeah. that they did that and stuff and I noticed there's a lot of some similarities in there yeah that was very interesting I think we're all artists uh you know find a way to to borrow or inspire by other people and then try to turn it into your own right because uh you know some people do it better than others but yeah there's definitely people that I open a book and I go, oh, I'm a fan of this person big time because I just love the way they portray things the way I've never seen it before. So yeah, it's goes into my favorite uh, bookshelf, right? So yeah, but I, that, that's why I think books are so important. Um, books need to be, I need to be surrounded by books. When I grew up, I had, my, my dad was like a book fanatic and um, being an architect, he was able to build this floor to ceiling, wall to wall book. I wish I would have shown it to you next time. Maybe I will. And, and by the way, I want to remind you that in December, we're going to have a conversation with uh, Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor. So many of you, if you have the opportunity, I don't know, Susan, is this, am I blowing a surprise here for you? Or? Um, no, it's no? just that uh, the uh, the Supreme Court is restricting who can oh, attend. Okay. okay. So it's mainly being done for third grade students. Oh, okay. All right. Serve about uh, 6,000 third graders just from Fresno Unified but we're going to be reaching out to the whole county of Fresno when we're oh, doing the Fresno nice. County Office of Ed. And uh, yeah, we'll see. The kids get priority and we'll see if there's, I think if there's anything. I think that's pretty after. fair. That's pretty fair too. That's great. All right. Yeah. So um, Justice is going to be on there with yeah. Raphael. And I mean, <laughs> we can't even, the, the kids are going to be asking her questions but every question has to be screened by the Public Information Office of the Supreme Court. 
mm-hmm. before well, they can even be asked. So like, we don't want to get rid of right? We don't want to happens. put her on the spot, of course. Yeah, yes. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, I look forward to that, and I look forward to uh, the kids having the opportunity to listen to her and her wise words and comments and you know her advice. So it's wonderful. Because she, she has her own story, too, about the book. That's the reason that she wrote the book, right? It's, it's actually autobiographical. Exactly. In exactly. some ways, because mm-hmm. um, she she's a lifetime diabetic from childhood mm-hmm. diabetic. Yeah. And, yeah. So. and she has a very good story that to tell that I won't tell today, but it, uh, I'm waiting for her to tell, which is very powerful. And that's one reason why she wanted to do this book. So, yeah, very cool. So um, any other questions that you you guys have? Uh, I mean, it's just been so much fun being with you guys. Um, books usually take about a year and a half from the time this, the, the manuscript comes to the, they polish the manuscript, um, the division of the pages, you know, how are this? Sometimes they leave it up to, they do it or they leave it up to me. And they say, how do you see this pagination going? I was like, ooh, wait a minute. You know, sometimes I prefer that they do it. Uh, some people like to have more control over that. Uh, another thing that m- f- some people don't know is that you never really have a conversation or a communication with the author. As an illustrator and authors, they try to keep us apart. And one of the reasons is you don't want to influence each other, right? I don't want to say, well, you know, that word is a little too long. And, uh, you know, could you change that? Because I need a little space for this pink little flamingo I'm having there, you know? And then, you know, they don't want her to say, well, you know, that's pink is not my favorite color. They want to have you guys separate. So that at the end, you, 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 in a way, portray your vision of what the story is about. And I think that's a pretty good idea. And hopefully, uh, the author likes it and you become friends at the end, which has been my case so far. So knock on wood. I, I've been very um, fortunate to have great collaborations with wonderful, wonderful authors. Huh? Raphael, yes. I mm-hmm. wanted to commend you so much for the strengthening the community with your mural projects i thought that was wonderful bringing community together and yeah. he- potentially healing community absolutely. i think that i yeah. love that we need it more um, than ever don't we Kay? yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely you know sadly the pandemic put a stop to my the murals because it, you know it's about <laughs> coming together but i there were a couple of guys one was canceled in washington near washington dc and there was another one on the middle east on, oh no on the midwest i'm sorry so um, yeah, we're waiting to, for things to get back to normal in some way and then get back to that, you know, cause it's, it's good. Continue to work with the community, bring it together. So yes. Great. <laughs> that. Anything else, you guys, any other questions? I'm, just, I'm actually curious about something. You mentioned that when you were first like in college that you were learning English, but when mm-hmm. you lived in England, did you speak Spanish the whole time? You know what? I, I did because the, the family was from Mexico. They invited me. And uh, there was a little bit of an issue there because um, they wanted to teach me English. And, and then I remember uh, at one time during dinner, I made the comment and said, guys, speak Spanish because I can't understand what you're saying. And Felipe got pretty upset at me. And he goes, hey, you got to give it a try, man. You know, I remember that comment. I would never forget it. Right. And, and then I thought, oh, at least I need to try. So, uh, yes, I learned it. But then I came back to Mexico and I was here another 10 or 12 years and I lost it. I lost it again, you know, and I even lost the accent I learned back then. And it was incredible. It was so much fun. Uh, they also saw me like it was really weird at the time. They saw me like this oddity, you know, because they saw this guy that was from another place. And I was living in this farmland area in the southwest of England. And the kids were wondering. I remember we could only take a bath every once a week because the animals have priority of water usage. So, and then they put us all on the bath at the same time and it was just hilarious though. But um, there was a lot of learning going on. There was a, a, a guy that was building instruments that were like all handmade. He would make them all, build them in the studio and then we, he'll put us on a circle. And then there was another guy with a video camera. I never seen a video camera in my life back in 1972. And then he connected what he filmed on the TV. And I saw myself on a TV screen. I couldn't, I, it was blowing me away. This whole thing is like, what was that and all about? <laughs> so we had a we had a great time. I mean, yes, they, they, were, they were this really idealistic hippie, bird, but they were just the wonderful, the most wonderful experience I could ever had. I mean, they taught me how to farm, how to collect decks, how to milk cows, this and that. And it's, it's an experience that I wish more people would have, you know, just be away from the city because I was a city kid. Raphael. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Look at the beautiful drawings in the back. Wow. They used to hang on the wall of the museum for a while. Oh, my I, goodness. They are so I beautiful. Them all. Wow. Uh, Rafael, I'm just curious if you still go back to San Miguel Allende. 
I do, Julie. I have a house there and I go there at least twice a year. I go there in the summers. Ah, I have a wonderful. studio, a smaller studio than this one. It's smaller, but it's there. And yeah. of course, it's, I spend uh, the New Year's, um, Christmas and New Year's. So yeah, it, and it's because ah. I'm in the border. It's just like a three hour hop from here to San Miguel de Allende. And I, I've been there now. Third, this is my third, no, 20 years. I'm sorry. I'm, 20 years. 20 years. Well, now. that's it. That's interesting because my aunt gave us a, her house in San Miguel. Oh. We went for 20 years, my sisters and I, but especially me as I taught Spanish. Oh, wow. And, Dude, and, well, it hasn't changed much. It's gotten bigger, though. It's, got, it's grown a lot. That's what I was wondering. We yeah. sold it six years ago, so I miss it. Yeah, the, the, the <laughs> downtown great. continues to be the same. They protected, you know, the, 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 um, yes. the Museum of Anthropology is really on top of things. So people don't change yeah. it, don't modernize it. They, they really protect it's a UNESCO World Heritage uh, site, so yeah. th there's not much you can do. You got to leave it as it as you see it, you know. That's and that's right. how we that's how we like it, you know. That's a great place, exactly. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you, you, Julie. Yeah, it's so fun to see someone that has been there too. Great, Julie. Yeah, so we, we were originally going to do this uh, studio tour from there. Yes, but his internet was so internet bad, was like and they movie. told him he couldn't get it until at least September. That was like in August we were supposed right, to. Right, right. So, so, we, so Susan okay. has been very, very flexible, guys. Uh, oh yeah, all the changes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we, we bumped it to October. Yes. Back in San Diego. It is. It is. So um, thanks again, everyone, for being in the studio here with me. I wish you could be here. We could do some fun stuff together. You know, for, <laughs> unfortunately, we can't yet. But uh, maybe one day you can all come down on a bus and then uh, just park outside and get a, you know, parking That'd ticket. Fun. Just have fun. If, it, if anyone, <laughs> does anyone else have any questions, final questions? or? It's fun. Mm -hmm. Hi, Elke. <laughs> how are you <laughs> fine thank you awesome well thanks again everyone i in, i truly enjoy your company and revisiting my past again that was kind of fun to go back in the past and i just wanted to share you know that the journey is not over yet and um because i'm only 60 i you know maybe i get another 20 30 years who knows you know yeah. another, another presentation i'm, I'm over that <laughs> <So you> do. <laughs> uh, yeah yeah let's do it <laughs> so, thanks so much for sharing this with and if you haven't come, if you haven't gone to the museum yet to see his exhibition, please go. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah. It's uh, it's the entire book from Just Ask. Yeah, and maybe there's maybe there's an opportunity that that might be there maybe in March or something. Yeah, right? we're hoping. Really, to well, we're working on that. We don't know yet. Author but, uh, book signing in uh, in March. March. Maybe yeah. I can meet yeah. some of you guys and uh, yeah. you know Definitely. tell you. And then I'll tell you that's a story about the mental block and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks everyone. Uh, have a wonderful thank afternoon. You, Raphael. Thanks you again, everyone. Well. And thank you, Susan, for everything you've done. It's been a real pleasure. And I, I consider you a really dear friend as well. Oh, me too. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks I'm everyone. honored. Take care. Okay. See you later, guys. Thank bye you. Bye.